You know, ever since I was a kid, I've always loved RPGs. And I grew up with some really good ones. Paper Mario, The Legend of Zelda, and of course my all-time favorite, Pokemon. There's just something special about these kind of games. Growing up, there always seemed to be so much more to them than I could get from anything else. I mean, after all, you take a game as fun as Mario, and you make it an RPG, and suddenly everything's different. I'm not just trying to get to the end of a level. I'm on a quest full of interesting people, cool locations, and awesome monsters to fight. Unfortunately, I was born in the late 90s, and my first console, the Nintendo 64. Now, I love that console, and I love the games I grew up with, but it does unfortunately mean I missed out on the 1990s era of RPGs. And that's a real shame, because it was kind of a golden era for the genre. We had games like Earthbound, Final Fantasy VI and VII, and Chrono Trigger. Games like that routinely end up placing highly on people's favorite games lists. And I'm not just talking about best RPGs, or best Super Nintendo games, or best games of the 90s either. You can regularly find games like Chrono Trigger on people's lists of the greatest games of all time. And that's for good reason. They were revolutionary in their age. They did so many fascinating things that had never really been done before in video games at the time. The thing is, I'm now an adult with a paycheck. So why don't I try and hunt down some old RPGs and play some of the things I missed out on? Vandal Hearts. I had literally never heard of this game before finding it on sale in my local retro game shop. One funny thing about it though is that, as you can clearly see, it's in this two disc case. However, the game is only one disc long, and where the other disc might be, it's just an ad for the game Suikoden. Weird, but hey, let's pop it in and see what we got. Wait a minute, Konami? I can't escape you! <laughs> Suiting music, dope sword. I'm intrigued, let's get into it. Sostagaria. For over a millennium, the fertile lands in the heart of this vast continent were ruled and immediately by the Holy Russia dynasty. Who could possibly be interested Taroa, in something Masai. long and boring like that right out the gate? However, it is the descendants of Taroa the Messiah. Wait a minute, Messiah? What kind of game am I getting into However, here? Sank into corruption and depravity. Forget cool sword, even though. the holy teaching of Taroa. The royal army's counterattack was swift and Oh no, not the doll! Time... To keep things moving along here, there is a monarchy, they sucked. Got overthrown in a revolution by some guy named Eris the Sage. Now there's a new government that's kinda democratic, but also kind of incompetent and corrupt because Eris went missing. You with me so far? Then there's a cutscene where this guy Magnus finds a weird temple in a glowy rock. Remember this, it'll be on the test later. Now let's actually start playing the game. And yes, that sword cutscene happens every time you get to a new chapter. We start the game as this guy, Ash. He's a member of the local security forces and he's accompanied by Diego 
and Clint P Picard? I think it's so. Good start so far if I can just figure out how to freaking use the buttons. For some reason, circle and X are reversed from how they normally are. Circle is your main confirm button and X is your back button. Throughout the video, you see me mess around with settings way more than I should. It's probably because I keep hitting the wrong buttons. But whatever, we're fighting brigands. That's a perfect opening enemy for this type of game. So, let's get started with killing them. Oh, it's one of them types of games. It's kind of hilarious, to be honest. Every single time an enemy or ally dies, they explode like a Tarantino movie. Every. Single time. The only exception are golems and other inanimate enemies who die like this. Also, the gold golems kind of look like Exodia. Konami! So we kill the bandits, report to our boss Clive, stop a riot, and then meet this guy, Kane, who slaughters all the guys we just got to surrender. Jerk. We're then sent by this guy, Dolph, on a secret mission to find out what happened to Magnus, that guy at the beginning. See? Said it was relevant. Along the way, we meet a few new friends and get our first new party members. Alini is the first mage we get, and she's Magnus's adopted daughter, found with amnesia, your typical JRPG sort of backstory. She joins us because she wants to find her dad, and she's joined by my favorite character, Huxley Hobbs. I should probably go over magic to explain why I find Huxley so hilarious. It's not just because he's named after both Aldous Huxley and Thomas Hobbes. Magic users are one of the best units in the game, since only them and archers can attack at a distance. And magic users get AoE attacks, which in later levels is incredibly useful. They work off of MP like your classic JRPG. You have to deal with them running out like any other similar game. What's neat though is that even if they do run out, or you just don't want to waste the MP, all mages and the priests can still attack with a basic physical attack. Which when that is combined with the game's blood explosions, means you can make old man Huxley beat stuff to death with a stick. Oh, and he can't heal stuff, which is pretty neat too, I guess. So we keep up with our quest. We meet a new hunter mercenary friend named Kira. We kill this giant reverse antlion thing for this drunk sailor boy named Grog. And as a bonus, some lady in a tavern gives us a sweet key. See, we need a ship to find Magnus, but some pirates have been harassing this port and it's implied that their captain killed Grog's brother and some of his friends. So, naturally, when Grog's ship is attacked, I'll have him finish off the pirate captain. Oh. Oh no. I just made a man kill his brother in cold blood. That's a thing I did. We make it to the island where Magnus is and are immediately attacked by possessed villagers. After freeing them from the possession, they tell us that Magnus was inspecting some old ruins on this island but he's now gone evil and turning people into monsters. Not a whole lot actually happens through the body of this chapter other than getting a few more recruits, some former non-monstrified Magnus soldiers, and we find a banana in a swamp which some kid gives us a key for, and we get our first promotions. Each character can promote into one of two classes, with the exception of Ash who only gets one because he's a hero. It doesn't provide a ton of variety to the gameplay since you get just enough units have at least one or two of each final class, but it is fun seeing the sprites change. Everyone gets their own unique ones, and my favorite is the guy Darius, who you get in Chapter 3. I turned him from an archer into a hawk knight, and instead of the wings that Kira got, he just got straight up jet engine strapped to his back. Right before we get to fight Magnus though, we see a cutscene where the bad guys are conspiring to screw us over, and they talk about a spy in our ranks. I wonder which party member it could possibly be. Still, we need to defeat Magnus. He can be a real pain and 
This is actually the first battle I lost on my first try. But we fell in without too much of a problem in round two. And we learned that he came looking for the magic stone that corrupted him because he knew the bad guys in the government were going to try a coup. And he wanted the extra support. I probably would have tried something like talking to journalists and politicians, informing them of the coup, getting some soldiers, or something like that. Before, I jumped straight to searching for ancient magical artifacts. But what do I know? It's not my government. So after we do all the hard work of stopping Grimace Magnus, these jerkwagons, Kane, Hellspites, and Dolph show up to take credit, arrest Magnus, Alini, and Huxley, because the jerks, and they tell us to go away. So naturally, we stage a prison break. We gotta stop these dogs from warning the guards, though, so... good guys, right? Well, once we get the gang out of prison, wouldn't you know it, Kira betrayed us and we're surrounded by bad guys. Just then, Magnus summons the last of his strength and fires off an incredible spell. Dolph blocks it with his own spell and the resulting magic clash rips open a hole in space-time, which we fall through. Time travel. Because why not? The chapter narration explains that after we fell into that hole in space-time, Hellspites became Emperor and imprisons a bunch of our friends and takes over the nation. Hell requests emergency powers from the Council, but as soon as he is granted those powers, his tyrannical nature emerges. Misa propose that the Senate give immediately emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor. Like a real Nazi. That's not even a joke. That they just they aren't hiding the Nazi parallel, like at all. Ash, Grog, and Sarah, our monk friend, end up trapped in a city of people stranded in time. Apparently we were in Kansas before. After burying Magnus, we meet this suspicious stranger, Zohar, who immediately agrees to help us get back to our own time, which we do. Except Zohar's magic time travel isn't precise, and we actually landed three full years after we left. We meet up with some of our friends, but we're coming back for everyone, so we immediately make plans to go attack a prison where they're holding Clint, Alini, and Amon. In this level, we have to ambush this convoy of guards before they can warn the prison of our attack. Not too bad once we've got their escape route cut off, so let's go ahead and kill their leader, Lando Hitman! Well, I've got a new username idea. Funny enough, you actually get to play the next few missions as Clint as the main hero. He's breaking out of prison with the rest of the gang. These juggernaut enemies are kind of fun, by the way. They're programmed to be instant hit kills as long as you hit their back, which makes killing them kind of hilarious, especially when you use someone like Alini's physical hits. Who cares about that, though, because as soon as Clint breaks out, Ash and Co. show up. We find a third key in the dirt outside the prison, and we kill the warden. Just what you do in a standard prison break. We also learn that the bad guys are looking for a royal ring that matches the magic stone from earlier. So the name of the game is Find the Royal Ring, but first we have to escape this horde of enemies led by Kane and the Crimson Guard. We totally spank them because magic users have absurd potential in this game. Then we run into this loser, Zeno, who starts the worst level in this game. Archers and similar ranged units get a bonus for being at a higher level. This bonus affects their effective range. And this level is almost entirely archer units, and it's almost entirely vertical. 
The enemy always has the high ground. <laughs> the ring we're looking for, though, has apparently been found by this somewhat shady merchant guy named Carlo Lisbon. We show up in his city and some random guy gives us a key because he likes our collection of weird stuff I've been finding in the dirt, like ramen. Okay. And hey, wouldn't you know it, Carlo Lisbon is actually our pal Diego's estranged father. That probably means he'll be straight with us and will sell us the ring and not screw us over. And he's sold us out to the Empire. Luckily, he does have a small crisis of faith when Zeno almost I kills Diego, so we don't get ring, ring fired. Fire. Diego roughly patches up things with his dad, and we go running after the ring to a gosh darn train level. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever, because this is clearly supposed to be a medieval fantasy style world, and they try to provide some justification in game about the train being some artifact of a lost empire. But in my mind, I'm pretty sure some Konami level designer just had a really cool idea for a train level, and no one said no. So we kill the boss, Dallas, Texas, we get the ring, and Zeno Ash projects himself to tell us he's going to execute Kira if we don't hand over the ring. But why would we even do that? Sure, she let Clint out of prison earlier, and she seems to be having a crisis of faith with the Empire, but... Why are we going to sacrifice a magical weapon of mass destruction for all and wait, we've made the trade? And of course, in classic Adam West style action, Zeno runs off and we have to dismantle his overly elaborate death trap in order to save Kira. Whatever, Kira's back on the team, let's just keep on with it. So with the ring and the stone, the Empire now controls the ominously named Flame of Judgment. Some sort of magical WMD. Then Dolph immediately kills the Empire, because he's Baron Von Edgeboy. Dolph doesn't want to rule the world with the Flame of Judgment. He wants to destroy the world with the Flame of Judgment. Meanwhile, we need to find something to do about that, so we go to some coordinates that were on the ring to see if we can find anything that might help us solve the whole flame of judgment. Either way, we kill some more Crimson Guard members, find a weird village in the mountains, and volunteer to save some people being attacked by monsters. Because heroism. In the process, we see this strange little blonde girl cast super powerful magic to defend herself from the monsters, which later our heroes grill this old guy, Erosius, about. Erosius explains that the villagers are descendants of the ancient empire that made the flame of judgment. And the little girl from earlier, Lena, says Erosius should help us out. He doesn't really want to, so he gives us the challenge of fighting a dragon in a nearby cave as a kind of test. Lena shows us where to find the dragon, we find a key and some lava, and we kill the dragon. Except, whoops a doo, Kane the Jerk followed us and he's executing the villagers. Jerk! We run him off and a dying Erosius tells Lena to help us by releasing the legendary weapon, Vandal Heart. We got a title! Lena leads us to the temple where the blade Vandal Heart is located and is about to break its barrier when Zeno shows up and hits Lena with a powerful spell. All hope is lost. Or is it? So at this point, I need you to remember the rules of the Vandal Hearts universe. Sufficiently powerful magic can warp space-time. Lena didn't die. She was transported back in time. She was found with amnesia by Magnus, who took her in and raised her. Lena is actually Alini, and Alini, remembering everything now that the whole time loop is complete, is able to release the seal, and we gain the legendary sword, Vandal Heart. So this is it, the final stretch. Our heroes are taking the fight 
right to the Empire, and Dolph himself. We only have a few more levels to get through. We resupply with good weapons and armor, and some guy gives us a key to go with our key collection. Our first obstacle is our old enemy, Kane, and I love this level. At this point, everyone's been promoted all the way, and we have all of our endgame abilities. For instance, our magic users can now do this. So we make our way towards Cave, slaying enemies that once gave us so much trouble. And right as we're knocking on his door, Zeno shows up and offers him the power to kill us for his soul. And because Cain is a jerk, he agrees. Cain blasts us with powerful AoE magic, which requires us to heal up everyone and to do this we have to group together. And then we just get hit by more powerful AoE magic. Cain's become one of the deadliest enemies in this game. That said, he's also become a being of pure darkness and evil. And he's lost his mind. So, we grant him one final mercy and end his suffering. On our way to the capital, we take out some more enemies, and it shows us just how far we've come. These same types of enemies gave us plenty of trouble in earlier levels, but now we can slay them easily. Except Ash is getting too good at killing them. Vandal Hart is making him hear voices, reminding him of when he was a kid. His dad was accused of being a traitor to the revolution. At the end of the level, Rebellion Leader Clive, our boss from Chapter 1, tries to stop Ash from going insane, and he gets slashed with Vandal Hart. At this point, Clive reveals his final secret. Ash's father was set up and was trying to protect Eris the Sage, the founder of this nation. Ash isn't the son of a traitor, he's the son of a hero. It is now with that final resolution that we can march on the capital. But first, you may have noticed that I've been finding a bunch of keys all over the place in this game. Vandal Hearts doesn't have much in the way of side quests, with this one main exception. You see, each key can be turned into the dojos where you promote your units to access the Trials of Toroa! Or as I like to call them, someone had fun with the level editor. They're all bonus levels where you fight some enemies on weirdly shaped maps and on each map there's a chest with a prism inside. These maps can be really fun and interesting, and also annoyingly hard. You often have to stall for time while you gain access to the chest, and you have to figure out how to do that a lot of the time. My personal favorite trial is the last one, the Trial of Heaven. It's just a straight shot of a map where you fight a horde of old boss enemies, and it's just a great way of showing us how far we've come in this game. Once you beat all six trials, you can access one final promotion for Ash. He breaks through his limits and becomes a shimmering golden hero, the mighty Vandalier. Now with this form, we go to the last two levels. We're able to kill Zeno outside the palace once again because magic is awesome! After all the crap him and Kane put us through, it's so good to finally take him down. Now only Dolph remains. This is a really tough fight, and I honestly have to restart a couple times. But eventually, I'm able to take out all of his acolytes and get it down to just Dolph. Come on, Ash! Let's show him Vandal Hart's true power! Like in just about any JRPG, I was kind of terrified when he went into his second form, but it really wasn't much to worry about. By this point, we had him massively outnumbered, and he goes down pretty easily. Dolph is really dedicated to the whole killing the world thing, and he lets loose one final magic blast, using the Flames of Judgment, consuming himself in the process. Ash, using the power of Vandal Hearts, 
is able to stop the blast, but vanishes in the process. The world is finally safe. The ending of the game is rather bittersweet. With Dolph and the Flames of Judgment gone, the Empire goes with them. But just like in real life, ending one evil regime doesn't immediately bring about a good and more peaceful one. There will always be evil people who take advantage of others. That said, we are treated to a good old-fashioned where are they now as the credits roll. We see that most of our friends live good and peaceful lives from here on out. Honestly, I was surprised at just how much I love this game. I can easily call it something of a hidden gem on the PS1. Almost every character gets time to shine and endear you to it. Alini with her amnesia figuring out where she's from, Grog and his brother, Diego and his father, Clint and Kira forming a relationship. And those are just a few of the great relations in this game. It's honestly kind of magical. The environments and levels were also really impressive. Plenty of games try to capture a retro aesthetic, and while they do it to varying degrees of success, it's very endearing to see it done so legitimately. They didn't have the option of capturing a retro aesthetic. This was what they had, and they did a great job with it. Vandal Hearts does leave us with one last note of hope. People must make their way by force of their will. It's only when people lose this will that evil is able to flourish and take power. Thank you for watching. We defend so be allowed, we fear.